So COVID-19, what impact is it having on us? We're much more stressed. Supposedly we're working a lot more. We're drinking a ton more. Corona is my first marriage. It's about 140 rolls of toilet paper, but no mask. Your ass is gonna be clean, but you're gonna be dead. My advice to you during this pandemic, wash your hands like you're washing Jason Momoa. Drew, let's light this candle. Go, go, go. This is No Mercy, No Malice. I'm Scott Galloway, professor of marketing at NYU Stern School of Business. Let's start with our rant. When media historians look back at these past two decades to understand what the zeitgeist of the time was and is, they'll look to the defining art form of our age, television. During disasters, our consumption of television content escalates 60%. And in the first two weeks of COVID-19, consumption exploded up 74% in New York alone. That's even greater than the 55% increase in alcohol consumption. I think I'm five and 10% of each of those numbers respectively. Why? Because the dog needs his alone time. True, we may be all in this together, but if the dog does not have some time to be in this all alone, he's going to put the entire family into the minivan and drive us all into a lake. The most disturbing thing about that statement the notion that I would own a minivan. Anyway, for a long time, the only two names that dominated TV with a unique process and culture that miraculously scaled creativity, HBO and Disney. Then came along Netflix, followed by Amazon and Apple, kicking off what has become the streaming wars. In this war, the most powerful weapon is original content, which the entertainment industry has spent over a hundred and $20 billion in 2019 on. That's what Russia, Germany, and Canada spend on defense combined. Who says capitalism isn't working? Which is comforting because if a T-14 Armada, the next generation Russian battle tank rolls into Poland, Joe Exotic and Brand Stark will likely repel these advances. By the way, I could so be Brand, totally be stoned, sit by a tree and then show up and say, I'm in charge. The dog's in charge. Anyways, Netflix was in pole position with the first mover advantage, cheap capital, and no pressure for profitability. They also had strong leadership that led a pivot from mailing DVDs to streaming. Their first innovation in TV, recognizing that advertising sucks. The average person will spend over two weeks a year just watching ads. Advertising has become a tax on the poor. How do you know your life hasn't worked out as planned? You know about innovation in light beer, South Korean cars, and how to treat opioid-induced constipation. Netflix spent $15 billion on content in 2019, which helped it amass 183 million subscribers in the first quarter. But who has a relationship with almost as many people? The warlord of capitalism, Jeff Bezos. Over 150 million people are subscribed to Amazon Prime and therefore Prime Video globally. To deepen Amazon's blossoming love with subscribers, it dropped six and a half billion dollars on content in 2019. That's a lot of cabbage, but it's only a small twig in the ever expanding forest that is Amazon. Who's the other tank commander rolling down Sunset Boulevard? Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, whose firm spent six billion dollars on original content in 2019. Their secret weapon in the streaming wars? Owning the rails, the operating system. Tech giants, including Amazon and Apple, give away the content to sell more school supplies or to make sure your fifth appendage is still an iPhone, meaning they can offer more content for less as they can monetize that content elsewhere. There's a term for this and it rhymes with monopoly. Monopoly, the only old economy company that has the leadership scale and access to capital to compete with big tech monopolies is in fact Disney. In the US, streaming searches were up more than 80% as lockdowns took hold, and the most searched brand was Disney Plus, accounting for 82% of searches. Disney previously forecast between 60 and 90 million Disney Plus subscribers by the end of September 2024. As we know, COVID brings forward the future, and Disney Plus already has over 54 million subscribers. Add on 32 million subscribers for Hulu and 8 million for ESPN Plus, 
And Disney combined has nearly 100 million subscribers. The consumer, at least in the short term, will win, as will great original content. The deepest pockets in the world begin paying crazy amounts of money to people who light up with Elon Musk. Joe Rogan, a $100 million deal. Spotify, boom up $1.7 billion on the news. The biggest losers will be the advertising industrial complex, its ecosystem, and the 99% of storytellers who are not remarkable as they see their currency in the marketplace and their salaries begin a steady march downward. In sum, in Los Angeles, when you order an Uber, he or she is likely to be a struggling actor. Soon, the guy or gal in the front seat may be an agency creative director or showrunner. In the back seat will be the guy or gal who, through a combination of luck and talent, made the jump to light speed and is thinking about her first NetJets card. Some solace, there's never been a better time to be unemployed, have a couch, a MedMen card, and a Hulu subscription. Yay. And now on to our guest lecturer. Derek Thompson is a staff writer at The Atlantic. He hosts the award-winning podcast, Crazy Genius, and authored the book, Hitmakers. Derek often writes about the evolving American workforce, millennials, and the media. Derek, first off, you're the only person I know with a worse background than me. You look like the PBS news hour in the Ukraine right now, whereas I'm a <laughs> hostage video. Tell my family I love them and I'll be home soon. Derek, Derek, COVID-19 <coughs> and media, your turn. Winners and losers. Well, look, I think uh, I was writing a big piece about the future of retail and how the pandemic is going to reshape it. And talking to a lot of people, I realized that there's sort of three categories of change. There's inventions, interruptions, and accelerations. So an interruption would be something like, you know, eating at a restaurant. I can't do it right now, but I certainly hope right. in two years I will be eating at restaurants. There's some inventions, too. So my grandmother, 92 years old, had no idea what Instacart was, and now she's getting all the groceries from Instacart. Right. I think that's an invented new behavior. She's not going to go back to wanting to wait at Trader Joe's lines for you know an hour hour and a half but most of the changes we're seeing are accelerations um, you see it in e-commerce e-commerce has been growing as a share of retail by about one percentage point every year for like the last 10 years yep. it went from 15 percent of retail to 25 percent of retail in about six weeks so that's 10 yeah. years of change compressed into six weeks that's an acceleration and i think in media you're seeing the exact same thing you're seeing an acceleration of deals you got Spotify, certainly on a compressed time horizon when it comes to picking yep. up the biggest podcast stars. And I think you see acceleration in terms of consumer behavior as well, where we're watching pay TV a little bit less and we're, and we're streaming television a lot more. Yeah, it's pulling the future forward. What do you think of the, the new guys, the BuzzFeeds, the Voxes, or the independents such as yourself, the Atlantic? Do they just get, do they either have to find their own billionaire or do they just get rolled over and consolidated? What do you think it looks like for the kind of the tier two guys? I'm even talking, there's the little guys, but what even like Pinterest, Twitter, Snap? What do you, What's your what's your best guess as to what happens there? Our advertising business this year, collectively in news media, is probably going to be cut by fifty percent. I mean, that is just catastrophic. If you whoa, whoa, whoa. are a company 50%, like you, fifty percent across across ad supported media and news, or just ad supported media in general, cut fifty percent. Ad supported media news from the bit yep. of reporting that I have done for lots of big players, medium players, small players, is going to decline in twenty twenty by fifty percent year over year. I mean, that's catastrophic for a business whose annual profit margin is in the single digits. So I think that what you're seeing is that some people, you're going to see a lot of companies moving to this sort of 19th century business model of DTC. Yeah. But if you don't have the backstop of VC and you don't have the backstop of a billionaire and you don't have the backstop of something else that is making you a lot of money, like a head start that The Times has with their, yeah. uh, the, the work they've done with digital uh, subscriptions for the last few years, it's it's going to be a bloodbath. Talk a little bit about the original gangster uh, HBO and the new strategy around HBO Max and AT and T as its corporate parent. Do you think HBO's best days are behind it, or the future only gets brighter? So I I'm a little confused about some of the branding around HBO yeah. Max. A part of me wants to say, well, if, for all these people who've known that this thing called HBO and or HBO Now and or HBO Go exists, why would they suddenly get it if now that it has a max attached to its name? Like maybe they like Friends, maybe they want right. to watch the DC Extended Comic Universe, um, but that doesn't seem like it's worth it for that marginal user that still isn't an HBO family. Um, at the same time, the bull case for HBO is that they're just the Barry Bonds of streaming. Their hit rate is so much higher than any 
other company, that it makes it look like they must be on steroids. They only have to spend $70 million per Emmy. Amazon's had to spend $350 million per Emmy. There's something in the water in the culture at HBO. Do you think that survives or goes away? It's a great question. Um, so far, it's done okay. I mean, look, I, I think Succession is one of the greatest shows in the history of television. I yeah. mean, I think it's an apps, just one of the best things I've ever seen. And, you know, yeah. that is a, that's a relatively recent show. Um, I've even wa been watching uh, the new Mark Ruffalo miniseries, Terribly Depressing. I know this much is true. It is just exceptionally well done. I mean, it is cinematic yeah. quality. Maybe the most underreported story was Kevin Mayer going to ByteDance slash uh, TikTok. Your thoughts? I thought Kevin Mayer was going to be the next CEO of Disney, hands yeah. down. Uh, that was what I was hearing from absolutely everybody. So the fact that he didn't uh, get that job was a shock to me. And this was an even bigger shock. Um, I think a lot of people are looking at this for what it means for TikTok. I think they should be thinking about what it means for TikTok's parent company, ByteDance. So he's not just going to be the CEO of TikTok. He's going to be the COO of ByteDance. There's the Sheryl right. Sandberg of ByteDance. That means he's going to oversee music and gaming and social media for them. And lie and, so and be the way, beard for a sociopath. Oh, wait, no, that's Sheryl <laughs> Sandberg. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No comment. Anyway. Um, okay. but I, I think that, you know, going forward, I'm interested to see, uh, to extend the sociopathic analogy, um, whether TikTok becomes the Instagram to ByteDance's Facebook. How yeah. does Facebook, how does ByteDance continue to extend its product line into other categories now that it has such a deep foothold uh, with TikTok for young people? We will see Derek Thompson, staff writer for The Atlantic. My brother, thank you for showing up. Best of luck to you. We will catch up soon. Thank you, TV star. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. Coming up next, our winners and losers include podcasting, an awesome homemade backyard roller coaster, Plus, our friend Kara Swisher makes a drive-by fruiting. It's sort of like Sex in the City 2020. It's not a two girls cat fighting story. They got in a fight about, about what they should be worth. People doing these things are talent and should be treated as them. Don't touch that dial. Don't touch it. Let's get to our winners and losers of the week. A loser. Facebook employees working from home will be clear. That means your job is going to keep moving to India. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg claims he expects 50% of the company's employees to work from home over the next five to 10 years. The social media giant is limiting offices to a quarter capacity when workers return in July. Facebook spent $4.8 billion on stock-based compensation in 2019 alone, not including cash. Expect Zuckerberg to find creative ways to get that as close to zero through cheap labor to boost the value of his shares. A winner, Amazon and e-gaming. Amazon took a big step into the gaming industry Wednesday with the launch of Crucible a free-to-play online shooter, and the company's first original big-budget game. Video game sales in March approached $1.6 billion, representing a 35% year-over-year increase. 35%. Gaming is expected to generate more than $160 billion in revenues in 2020, making the business more than twice the size of the global recorded music industry, around $19 billion, and worldwide film box office receipts, around $43 billion combined. Think about that, bigger than music and movies combined. A winner, this grandfather, Gregory Sherman, for building a makeshift roller coaster in his backyard to entertain his grandson while the family is stuck at home during quarantine. A winner, podcasting the Joe Rogan and Call Her Daddy boom. The Spotify podcast deal could make Joe Rogan the world's highest paid broadcaster. Rogan's multi-year deal is believed to be worth in excess of $100 million. Mr. Rogan has over 9 million subscribers on YouTube alone. In other news, the popular Barstool sports podcast, Call Her Daddy, gained legions of loyal fans when it jumped from 12,000 to 2 million downloads in just two months with a secret strategy called sex. Who would have thunk it? To illuminate us on the trend towards podcasting is my podcast pivot co-host, the Jungle Cat, Kara Swisher. <laughs> Kara, thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm here from my bedroom. My I hear we bedroom. want a Webby. By the way, what are you wearing? You look like a new character in The Handmaid's Tale, season 11. What are you wearing? <laughs> what is going on I've there? Since college. It's a, it's a sweatshirt I've had. It's from The Gap. When it was called nice. The Gap. Nice, Gap. Ne next one to go yeah. bankrupt. You heard it here first. 1980s. 1980s. It's really English I, B, I stick, R I stick with a look. There you go. So, okay, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan, 100 million bucks. I think that means we're worth yeah. like 80 or 90 bucks. Say more. How does yes. this make any sense? 
Well, it's interesting. I mean, you could look at it a couple of ways, like it, as if it's like the Howard Stern moment, like yeah. serious for them. And that's one way of looking at it, of course. Um, and that this they need Spotify has been buying up all kinds of things, Gimlet and uh, uh, Bill Simmons and everything else. So it's they're buying up talent. So they dominate the exclusivity in the podcast space because they're taking it seriously to differentiate themselves because music is really a losing game for everybody in a lot of ways. And so it's it's part of owning audio, I guess. And so yeah. there's other players going to are trying to compete in this. The New York Times, uh, probably Amazon, Google will enter the fray and things like that. And so Spotify is trying to put a lot of distance in a Netflix like way between them and everybody else. So let's have some fun. Talk to me about the yeah. call me daddy controversy. What's going on there? <laughs> It's too girl. I don't. I don't listen to it, but it's a very popular podcast where they just yeah. talk about. It's sort of like Sex in the City, twenty twenty. Essentially, that's what it feels like. And so they had, you know, as they knew, they realized their value. It's hope. I'm hoping we can get in a fight like that. But there's some. And by the way, I'm the involved. hot busty one. If we're if we're call me daddy, I'm <laughs> the think, hot busty one. Just I think so you know, they're both that way. Pretty hot but and okay. pretty busty. All right. Yeah. I didn't exactly. even notice. I don't see looks, Kara. I don't see okay, looks. No, Anyways, no, back to you. That's all you see. But they got in a fight about about what they should be worth. And I think yeah. one of them wanted to make a settlement with Barstool and other didn't. And there was a boyfriend involved. But aside from that, the whole point is that these are valuable properties and people doing these things are talent and should be treated as thus. And I think that's what's interesting. Um, away from the fact, you know, to, essentially, they, it's not a two girls cat fighting story. It really isn't. It's about how to deal with talent. And how to pay for it because it was really surprising how much money the, this this pair pulls in and how important it is to barstool. Does this signal more consolidation and big tech just getting stronger because they show up with the deeper pockets, or is this an opportunity for Vox and Luminary and Wondery? Is this an opportunity for a great new media age with new players, or is this just going to end up where it always ends up with Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google? Well, no, I don't think it is because Netflix still seems to be dominating the video space, right? Yeah. I always thought that Netflix should buy Spotify and then that would be a real killer combination. But no, I mean, Netflix, I don't call Netflix big tech, even though it's included in Fang. I just don't. It's much smaller. And the same thing with Spotify. It's been an innovative player and it's actually outrun Apple Music and others, although they're seeing a lot of competition from Apple Music, but it's outrun the big, the big dogs. And they're trying to get into this space before they can get in. So they're not big tech, they're medium tech, I guess. But I definitely think consolidation is happening. A hundred million dollar deal. Everybody thought it was crazy. Within 24 minutes mm -hmm. of the announcement, the market cap of Spotify up $1.7 billion. And I think that spells champagne and cocaine for the big dog <laughs> and the jungle cat. All right, I'm gonna let you get back to work. I'm gonna let you get right. back to work. Thanks for showing All up, right. Kara. All right, See you good soon. luck with the cocaine and, and champagne. And anyways, when we come back, I'm taking your questions in our office hours, plus our algebra of happiness, a life lesson for young males, and some nudity from yours truly. True story, true story. Hope you didn't just eat. And now it's time for Office Hours. Our first question, roll tape. Hi, Professor Galloway. My name is Georgia Mayer, and I'm a media and tech analyst from London. My question is about digital ad revenues. Given that this aspect is going to be the fastest part of the market to recover, and given that Netflix subscriber numbers have gone up during lockdown, do you ever envisage a scenario where Netflix would experiment with traditional ad formats beyond branded content, given how premium this inventory is? Any insights, welcome. Cheers and take care. Thanks, Georgia. So never say never, but I think part of Netflix's brand is that you get to avoid advertising. And what's mediocre content feels like pretty good content because it's not interrupted by you're doing amazing laps in a pool and someone does a cannonball and pees in the pool every 11 minutes. That's called advertising. So I don't see it in the short term. Thank you for the question, Georgia. And now our algebra of happiness, equations for a happy life for my second book of the same name. We're in quarantine at least those of us that don't have our heads up our asses. Anyways, yeah, I said it. By the way, the virus is indifferent as to whether or not you feel it's time to get back to your regular life. Maintaining physical distance is important, and so is maintaining physical fitness. Now more than ever, exercise is my antidepressant. I get seriously down if I don't sweat three to five times a week. We've been taught in high school that athleticism and intellect don't go hand in hand. But that's a lie. Winners in life keep themselves fit. This isn't about fat shaming. It's about being a stronger version of you. The world's most successful business leaders 
are in great shape. The average Fortune 500 CEO works out 45 minutes a day, and there's a positive correlation between CEO fitness and shareholder value. Tim Cook works out every morning. Bezos is the only guy I've seen who is 10 times hotter in his 50s than in his 30s because of his biceps alone. If you're going to have a midlife crisis, go all in, dog. Go all in. Anyways, it's not just business people. There's an inherent power that comes with a six pack. But more important than the aesthetic, feeding our instincts. Humans are happiest when we are in motion and in the company of others. The goal here is simple. You wanna be able to walk into any room and if shit gets real, know that you could one, either kill and eat everybody or outrun them. We need to channel this energy in a modern context. Use this time in quarantine to work your body, build strength, and get yourself on a ferociously successful track. There are people who sweat and people who sit around watching others sweat in all aspects of life. Show me someone who watched ESPN every night and football all day Sunday, and I'll show you a future of anger and failed relationships. In sum, the ratio of time you spend sweating relative to watching others sweat is a forward-looking indicator of your success. It's important to have role models in any domain you are trying to improve. My role model for fitness, El Santo. So when I say El Santo, I'm of course referring to Mexican luchador and mascarado, film actor, folk hero, and genuine Mexican sports legend, Rodolfo Guzman Huerta. Despite being only five foot seven, El Santo fell opponents like they were segundo period French. If you're offended by my Spanish, Tweet at me and you will get a full refund. And when I say room, walking into any room, I mean any situation or challenge for that matter where discipline and preparation would provide you with additional confidence. Case in point. Soy el santo. Me someteras. Boom. So I just became very self-aware like a tsunami. Uh, self-consciousness, lost a little bit of my mojo right now. That's what I'm feeling. Okay, okay, we're gonna be dead soon. Gun shows in town, bitches! That's right! He's back.